begin our assembly together. I want to encourage everyone to find their spots and to get their songbooks ready. <coughs> it's interesting that if you make a comparison between the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, there's a number of similarities in their structure. They have sections that we refer to as history. Uh, they have sections that are prophetic. But it's interesting that we don't necessarily uniquely identify a section of the New Testament as wisdom literature. Um, we just kind of go back and say the wisdom literature is in the Old Testament and we kind of leave it there on the structure. It's not saying, because we recognize that there's wisdom in the New Testament, right? There's wisdom in the writings of the apostles. There's wisdom in the statements of Jesus. And I want to suggest to you as we worship together today that you remind yourself that the big contrast that is not identified in that categorization method of the Old Testament and New Testament, Hebrew Bible and Christian Bible, is that God's word itself is wisdom. The message of God is wisdom in contrast to the mind of man. Paul makes a play of that in his letters to the church of Corinth, talking about how Men look at the simplicity of the gospel as foolishness, but it is the wisdom of God revealed. And when you consider the teaching of Jesus, it is the personification of wisdom and practice. For Jesus not only declares God's message, explains its ap application, but he goes to one more level that is not always found and most particularly found when we attribute some of that wisdom literature to the life of Solomon and that he practices it. He not only preaches it, explains it, but his life matches both the proclamation and the explanation. So today when we worship together, my encouragement to all of us, myself included, is twofold. One, that we listen and learn to the wisdom of God, but we learn to do so in a way that matches our practice to our profession of Jesus. Even in the simple things of how we worship together, that our hearts are more like his, full of grace and seasoned with understanding, compassionate and forgiving, even to the point of dealing with forgiving those who have wronged us heavily and significantly, and being compassionate enough to those to say, the Father will forgive you too, and I will as well. Let's worship together. <clears throat> Number 508. 508. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock The shadows of dry, thirsty land He hideth my life in the depths of His love And covers me there with His hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock, the shadows of dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love. 
and covereth me there with his hand, and covereth me there with his hand. When clothing in brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in a cliff of the rock, shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. <clears throat> Number 509. 509. After this song, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. We'll sing all three verses. <clears throat> I will sing the wonder story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I sing the wondrous story of a Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his love, the arms around me drew me back into his way. Yes, I sing the wondrous story. Of the Christ who died for me, sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river. Roll its waters at my feet, then he'll bear me safely over where the lost one I shall meet. Yes, I sing the wondrous story of the cry who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Let's pray. Almighty God, who reigns in heaven, who is the ruler and creator of all the earth, the author and the father of our salvation, we are so grateful unto you for preserving our lives to this day, O Lord, for there's nothing within us to extend our life a single day, but as you have willed, so we have survived, and we thank you so much that you have cared for us. You have watched over the physical things of this life, and they matter to you, too, that we have food and we have shelter, we have warmth in times of cold and we're comforted in times of heat. We're so grateful unto you, O Lord, for all that you have blessed us with, all that you have given to us in this physical life. And 
Let us always remember these things you've given to us. They are tools and objects to be used in service to you. Let us never become consumed in these physical things and the amount that we may collect in a bank account, O oh Lord. Let us use it for what is appropriate in a service unto you. And we ask, O oh Lord, and we give thanks that you would continue to watch over these physical things as we need them in life. And as we serve you, you will provide. And we're so grateful that you have cared for us even more so than the lilies of the field or the birds of the air, that the physical things of this life are a concern unto you. We're so grateful. But even more so than all these good things that we have on this life, <clears throat> physical things that we have in this life, what you have done for us spiritually, O oh Lord, we can never give thanks enough for. We sought our own ways. We sought to fulfill our our desires, and they led us astray, and we went far from you. But you had loved us so, you had cared for us so, and you desired us back. We thank you so much that you had set up a plan that we would be redeemed and be brought back to you and have peace with you through your Son. And we thank you for the life that he lived, the teaching that he did on this earth, and that the sacrifice that he made for us, that he laid his life down, that we may live spiritually, we may, our souls may survive when this life is over, and we Thank you so much for all that your son has done, that he has suffered so greatly, so immensely for us. He has redeemed us, made us pure through his blood. We are healed, and we thank you so much. And we know all this to be the truth, O oh Lord, and we thank you for your spirit, for he has preserved this word. He has used men throughout history, rich and poor, farmers, workmen, all to teach your word, and all of it is sound, all of it is concise, all of it is unerring and contradicting, O oh Lord. We thank you so much for that, that unique word that we have through your spirit that we may know exactly what it is you've desired. And we thank you for the consistency through it all that we can have faith and believe and serve you. And we know what makes you happy. We know what pleases you. And we know what brings wrath and anger and that we may shun those things but live for righteousness. We thank you so much. And as we're gathered here today, O oh Lord, we ask that you would Edify those things that are well-pleasing before you. May the songs that we sing be a sweet sound in your ear. May the prayers lifted now and through this service, may it be a sweet-smelling aroma unto you. And we ask that as we break the bread of life, O Lord, as we examine your word, may we remove ourselves from a hard heart, but be willing to take those things down and understand and apply them to our lives. We ask we'd soften, you'd soften our hearts now as we hear the word, and may we be better tomorrow than we have been today and have been yesterday, O oh Lord. We ask that you would be with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Remove these worldly things from our mind, O oh Lord. There's so much that goes on that distracts us, but we ask that you would help us to focus our mind on what has been done for us, that your Son gave his life and suffered and has risen, and we have been redeemed through his blood. Let us focus on that, O oh Lord. We thank you so much that you would Give us one more opportunity to serve you in this capacity. We ask that you would be with us through this service. Help us to do what is most righteous and well-pleasing before you, what's been laid out in your scriptures. We thank you most of all, and we ask in your son's name. Amen. Number 613. This will be the psalm before Philip bring us the lesson. We'll sing all three verses. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth on who can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hope to God's unchanging hand. Hope to God's unchanging hand. Oh, to God's unchanging hand, build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand, trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if thy earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. Hope to God's unchanging hand. 
Hope to God's unchanging hand Bear your some things eternal Hope to God's unchanging hand When your journey is completed if to God you have been true, fair and bright the home in glory, your in rapture so will be. Hope to God's unchanging hand. Hope to God's unchanging hand. Things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. Invitation song be 909. 909. If you've got your Bibles out, uh, this is particularly for those who have physical paper Bibles, pick it up and hold it for a second. Uh, and then get, hold on to it for a moment and think about something. Most of us probably have in that Bible just two things, the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible or the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a relatively new thing. You can put it down now so your arms don't get tired. As long as you kind of get the hand in it and you know, feel about it. Most of the bindings of the Bibles that we use contain those two things. Um, there is a number of arrangements of the Bible that include two other sections. Um, the Apocrypha is one of the aspects that's mentioned in it, um, or wisdom literature, things that are not inspired, but are biblically adjacent. They're next to the Bible. They're written by people who have a deep interest in spiritual things from ages gone by. And there's a large number of those writings. Um, we kind of clump them together <coughs> into different categories based on either how close to the canon we think they are and use terms like apocrypha or pseudopigrapha, means false writings. So you can tell those ones are really far from being connected. The apocrypha generally is much more uh, close to what we would consider the canon of authenticity. And those things are things that over the years people have said, hey, that's pretty good. We know it didn't come directly from God, but it's informative. It's, it's, it's valuable. In those writings of the Apocrypha and the area are additional wisdom books, things that were written by unknown believers, believers in God, believers in, in Yahweh, that would be commonly understood to say this is not the Bible. It's not the Hebrew Bible. It's not the scriptures. But we read it. We all read it together. Do you know we do the same thing? It's something that we do a lot. Here's how it manifests for us. Think about the very verbiage that we use to introduce and close a prayer. The way that we begin them and end them. It's not inspired, is it? But it creates the sense of community and familiarity that we know, hey, that, it's time to pray now. And things that go along with that, body posture, behaviors, hand movements, all those things inform communication so that we can connect and understand. And they create these kind of reservoirs of experience. Like we go back in that well again, and it feels really familiar. Culturally, outside of religion, outside of the church communities that we're familiar with, we do that as well. Think for a moment on the way in which advertising is so easily ingrained into your head. Some people will get this statement, and some of you will not. Where's the beef? You now know your age based on how you respond to that statement. So now, like, I didn't get that. Does that mean I'm too old or too young? I'm confused. You also just may not have known the reference. Shift genre out of advertising and go into movies. Think about how movies inform our conversation and culture and how that gets part of our common conversation. They change the way we think about things. Even good 
sound reasoning becomes established as a source of wisdom that we then apply in practical ways. Uh, one of the ones that comes primarily from military service into personal life uh, is two is one and one is none. So what does that even mean? If something is really important, like you absolutely have to have it, and you need at least one of them, you bring two. Because two is one, and you only have one, that thing will break. Eventually, you'll forget it, you'll drop it. And if it's that mission critical, you bring two. In case one of them fails. So that's earthly wisdom that's found its way into my life as a phrase that kind of echoes in the back of my head. <coughs> I say that to say this. When we read our Bibles, we don't always know that many of the speakers, teachers, preachers, leaders, instructors, prophets are doing many of those same things. We don't know because we're not steeped in the culture of the first century. We weren't raised around Second Temple Judaism and all of their wisdom literature to see how familiar that sounds and how that echoes, hey, this is meant to be understood as wisdom because it sounds so much like something else that's super familiar to me. I'm going to read to you a portion of the wisdom books, the Sorosh in particular, which is often included in Bibles bound um, in antiquity. Uh, and a lot of the Eastern Orthodox churches include this particular book in their bindings of the Bible, although they all recognize that it's not Scripture. It's the equivalent of our Bible study guides that we sometimes also bind into our Bibles, and they, they look at it much like that. But in um, Sadach, uh, there is a concept that comes forth, and it plays off something that's also familiar to you and I. See, in Proverbs chapter 8, this is the this part where the familiarity comes in. Proverbs 8 begins in verse 1 with this familiar statement. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? Right? That's familiar. We've read that before, perhaps even recently for you. In Sirach 24 in verse 19, they use the same numbering system to make it easy on us. It says, Come to me. You who desire me, and eat your fill of fruits. Now that might sound familiar to something we're going to read shortly in Matthew in chapter 11, particularly in the latter part of that section. See, the author of Sirach, whoever that is, also writes with grappling with wisdom. Sophia is the Greek word that's used there. And directing his soul towards wisdom in Sirach 51. In that section, he will go on to describe the fruits of wisdom in a way that, again, will create that familiar resonation of where's the beef. You'll, you'll hear it in the same echoes. Sirach 51, verses 26 and 27 read as follows. Put your neck under the yoke. And let your souls receive instruction. It is found, or it is to be found, close by. See with your eyes that I have labored little and found myself much rest. I want to suggest to you as we open our Bibles this morning together and worship that God is seeking to equip us with wisdom for life. And he doesn't do it bluntly like we sometimes tend to do. Because here's my illustration of that. How often has someone come to you and plainly just simply said, hey, here's some wisdom for you. You should apply it in your life. How well does that function in practicality? Like on a first level, how likely are you to remember it when you need it? If your brain is anything like my messy space of a brain, the likelihood of remembering it when I need it, when I absolutely need it, diminishes to zero really quickly. Unless one or two things have happened. I've seen something specific in the life or practice of the wisdom giver where they live the wisdom. Oh, I saw them do that. I saw that take place. 
And then they said that instruction to me, and it clicked. Or something so significant happened that it brought it back to memory. You know, I remember when they used to tell me, I should remember that next time. And so that diminished to zero has a little bit more of its own life and its own pulse and its own beat. You see, now if we turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, which I've hinted at before, and you may have caught the reference already as it resonates with your remembrance of Jesus' teaching, pay attention to verses 20 to 30 with an emphasis of verses 28, 29, and 30 when we get there. But Matthew 11, verse 20. Then he, being Jesus, began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows ex- uh, the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, if you didn't catch the resonance early on, you'll get another chance later on to kind of go back and see how those bits of wisdom from Torah followers, law followers, Israelites from the communities that surrounded the life of Jesus and the disciples interacts with the eventual message of the Son of God. And you can see how that give and take takes place. But circle around right now to what's going on in this text. When we think about God's wisdom displayed before mankind. It's a very powerful picture painted by the hand of God. When he employs the literature picture of Sodom and Gomorrah, you don't get much lower in human history than the atrocities that take place in that cultural context. There's not much worse in that setting than that. And so on a sense of language level, he's using the idea of hyperbole there, not to say that the literalness isn't true as well, but to say, you guys thought that that was the low point for humanity? Understand that they've now reached a new low. And we don't think of lows in this area in the same way. Because Sodom and Gomorrah is what we consider perhaps abject or absolute immorality. But the cities mentioned here, they are engaged as a group though not every single individual in every household, but as a group, in the abject or absolute rejection of God in their midst. And as the scales are laid out, the Bible is resolutely similar in regards to how it handles each of them. Abject immorality, repentance is always an option. Absolute rejection of God, condemnation is always the outcome. So you think about how God sees those events and how we do. We would rather be in the place that simply rejected God as a standard rather than the one condemned in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? 
Because which of us would pick one of those places to live? We know that it's not good to live in Sodom and Gomorrah, but we're totally chill with living in places that reject God altogether. Like we'll find a way to make that work in our mind. In Christ, he's actually teaching a different standard for wisdom to exist in. That struggling against sin and struggling with sin moves you more in line with God's expectation for you than simply rejecting God altogether. That's a hard pill of wisdom to swallow. But it matches precisely what Paul also teaches to the brethren at Corinth in regards to how the world sees them. Fools for accepting God. And yet they accepted God and struggled with their sins and found ways to overcome and to find repentance and to grow and to mature and to be more than they were. That also then hints at the picture that Jesus has painted because that motif or picture of destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and condemnation for cities and communities that rejected God altogether pushes toward perhaps one of our most familiar sayings of Jesus. And one that is in stark contrast to the image he just created. It is that contrast that we have to juggle with and pay attention to. And these Galilean towns that were not responding to not only the miracles in presence of their view and setting, they weren't repenting. All the way back in chapter 4 and verse uh, 17, this process began to make itself apparent. This leads to three practical realities that we have to consider, three simple truths with this conflict in wisdom. Foremost, Jesus warns the people who have heard his message and seen his signs to be prepared if they are not willing to respond with repentance. Do not be surprised when judgment comes if you have rejected the offer of God in very simple terms, with no caveats or questions. Secondly, particularly in verses 25, 26, and 27, the kingdom is being turned upside down as the world views it. You'll notice in the reading of those, uh, that passage there that the wise, the powerful, the structure are elevated in the current context. But Jesus calls those who understand his message, you are the little children. And that kingdom reversal plays out through all of Matthew's message where those who have nothing, who have no power, no money, no land, no holding, no appearance of wisdom, will be elevated. And so he is driving that second truth home. Realize that hasn't changed. That is still the, the same expectation for the kingdom of God. That those that the world finds great, that is not the standard that God uses for true greatness in the kingdom. And thirdly is the application space for us to walk towards. In that, Jesus himself is now presented to us as wisdom made man. It is a great textual counterplay to the opening refrains of the Gospel of John. When John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then what happens next? The Word dwells among men. And so we have divinity made flesh. Well, Matthew's message in part here is to identify that you've heard of wisdom all your life. Wisdom at times is personified as a woman, personified as God absolute, personified as knowledge of great value and worth to be equivalent of gold and silver. But it is not until Jesus walks the earth that wisdom is practically personified as an individual. And so in this case, the gospel presents by inspiration in the hand of Matthew that Jesus himself is wisdom personified, wisdom made visual and practical. And wisdom, Jesus, offers rest 
to those who will follow his way. Now, as I mentioned before, I, gave, I said you have another chance to see this. So this is the wisdom text from Sirach uh, 51, verses 26 and 27, with a couple of qualifiers. You'll notice strange writings from a language not known. That's Greek made into English, and so you can pronounce it that way. And since it's Greek, nobody actually knows how to pronounce it properly because it's a dead language. So whatever you pick, you're kind of right. So, so have that confidence. It's not like the Old Testament list of names where you just know you're wrong no matter what you do, even if you're right. With Greek, classical New Testament Greek, nobody's quite sure how to pronounce it. So the text here says, Put your neck under the yoke, zygos, and let your souls, psyche, receive instruction. It is to be found, um, hit our sicko close by. See with your eyes that I have labored, copile, little, and found myself much rest, and apostles. All right? That looks familiar, right? You've heard it now twice. Now you have a little interjection of, of, of baby Greek into it. Now this is the passage we're familiar with, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, copeo. And I will give you rest and a pool. Take my yoke, zygos, upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find herosiko, rest, and a pus for your souls, psyche. For my yoke, zygos, is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus has done here is a teaching technique that is super common. We build from simple models instructed early on in life with the absolute intention to take those simple building blocks and eventually lay them together to make a train. And that train sticks with us. It becomes much like the conjunction junction, which is what is our function. They hook up words and they make them function. Again, if you're a parent or a child, you know that song. At some point or another, you heard the, BB, uh, the PBS version of it. It told you this is how words function, right? And it's stuck there. Jesus has done this technique often in his teaching and preaching where he pulls from the wisdom of the age, just like Paul does, and then presents it to the audience in ways that helps inform the details. But note this, he's pulling not only from the wisdom of the age, it's the wisdom of ages before that day, that were familiar to the community of disciples. They knew these statements. This was common verbiage for them in their practice. And now it got tied together in a person. This helps us understand more deeply what God has done in all the things for us, but on the practical level. Note again that what Jesus has done is fully become wisdom made flesh, just as much as God was made flesh. And so we will tell ourselves in prayer and in practice that our goal is to be more like the Son of God, to be like Jesus. We will declare, like Paul did, I will follow Christ, and you should too, as I follow Christ, follow me as I follow him. Let's both go there. Much like the disciples called a few other close friends to hear Jesus. But remember, when we do that, we are accomplishing more than just becoming Christ-like which you can remind yourself is to become like God, because Christ is God, but to become gospel, good news, wisdom. See, if we're equipped for life, then the gospel should be manifested in our life, and we ourselves are going to become, to many, perhaps to some, the only wise people that surround them. And how important it is then that our life look like Jesus' life and right now, just in this narrow space. How many times have you presented yourself as a Christian and that it's such a burden to be a Christian? It's so hard. It's so difficult following Jesus. Ask yourself this question. How many times, if that occurs in someone's life, are they going to go, nope, that's not for me? Versus how many times have you come to someone and talked about how light it is to take upon the yoke, of, the yoke of Christ and how Jesus lessens the burdens. 
if this had been your first interaction with the message and someone came to you, it is super awful to be a disciple. You don't want to do it. Noted. Okay, I won't do that. Right? That's how your response would be. But that's not the gospel. So in your wisdom, as you engage with the world around you, recognize that not only your speech says that, but so does your behavior. If your life looks like it's really hard to follow Jesus, everyone can see that no matter what comes out of your mouth. And just as much as when someone tried to offer you some advice, some wisdom, and you didn't hear it because their life didn't match it, so it will be with the gospel itself. My admonition then is that we live in a way that shows that Jesus has made things better. That we demonstrate the joy that's found in Christ. And we live in a way that not only others can see it for the good that it can do, but also that we know that the good it does for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the privilege that it is to worship together. We ask in very simple terms that you grant to us the wisdom promised. Help us to understand and see your Son in our lives and live in a way that is of glory and honor to you and to him. Forgive us of our sins. Watch over our souls. Protect us from temptation. And in all things, may you be glorified and honored. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. In just a moment, we'll have time to sing together and worship together in our continuing time this day. And as we do that, I want to encourage you to remember a couple of things. Foremost is, while this is a convenient time to dig deep into your spiritual condition and setting, it's not the only time. I think it's probably one of the reasons why in the book of Acts we have that phrase in the same hour of the night. It's just to warn you that any time is fine. And if you need our prayers and our encouragement that comes through our communal worship together, or you wish to be encouraged in other ways, or you need the help from your brethren, the very best thing you can do is the most powerful tool you have in your pocket. Hey, can I get some help? Is to ask. So if we can be of encouragement to you, we can be of strength to you, spiritually or otherwise. You can let us know now or another time, but right now let's stand and sing together. It is for you and me, let us haze away to his brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam. From the throne of life, now it flows. While the waters roll, let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come to for you and me, thirsty soul? Hear the welcome call, tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's clear and no soul is left. Then may not it pure water share.
tis for you and me, and his dream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. You may be seated, please. <clears throat> to help prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 383. 383. Sing all three verses. Jesus, keep me never cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flow from Calvary's mountain. time to reflect on some of the events that took place just before and during our Lord's crucifixion. We want to uh, reflect on the treatment of our Lord just before he was crucified. In, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, I'm going to begin reading at about verse uh, 15. Then came Jesus forth wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold, 
the man. When the chief priest, therefore, said, and the chief priests and officers saw him, they carried out, cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, but I find no fault in this man. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that that saying, he was troubled in mind and afraid, and went again into the judgment hall and said, and said unto Jesus, Whence forth art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer at all. Then said Pilate <clears throat> unto, unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to set thee free? Jesus answered him, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto you, they have the greater sin. And it was the, uh, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests and the elders answered, We have no king except Caesar. There, then delivered he <clears throat> him therefore unto, the, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away to be crucified. When they crucified him and two others with him, either one side, one, of, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews For the, for the place where Jesus was crucified was, was near to the entry, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother, sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by the cross, when he whom, and the disciples standing whom he loved. He said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he unto the disciple that he loved, Behold thy mother. And after this Jesus, knowing that all things were now uh, accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. <coughs> now, 
Now there was set a vessel of full of sour wine, and Jesus said, I thirst. And they put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and breathed his last. With those thoughts in mind, we are going to give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father who art in heaven, we're so grateful unto you for this, another Lord's Day. So grateful that we can reflect on the life just before enduring our Savior's crucifixion. We are grateful for this bread, which represents his body. And we pray that as we partake of this bread, we would do so in a grateful manner. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> Again, we will bow and give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, we continue our thanks unto you for this Lord's day. Continue our thanks unto you for this opportunity to be able to assemble together as saints to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of our Savior, which was given for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray that as we partake of this, we will reflect on the purpose of this fruit of the vine and do it in a manner pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Christ's name we ask. Amen. That concludes our observance of the Lord's Supper. We will now lay by in store as we've been prospered, as we are commanded by the scriptures as members of this congregation to give back a portion of that which we've been blessed with so that the gospel will be continued to be spread in this area. There's a basket in the back where you can drop your contribution in as you go out the door. And we will now give thanks for the contribution. Father in heaven, we are so grateful unto you for all that you have blessed us with. We're grateful for the opportunity to give back a portion of that which we have been blessed with, that the gospel may continue to be spread in this area, and that those that are in need, uh, members that are in need, can be helped. We pray that you would bless this gift and bless us as we give it. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. 